Hello everyone, this is Dr. Hanifa. Welcome to MBPS classes. Today, in this video, we'll discuss about the anatomy of mastoid and the pneumatization of mastoid ear cells. Mastoid is a part of the middle ear cleft, as we remember. The term mastoid is derived from two Greek words. It is arised from the mastus, which means breast, and edius, which means resemblance. So, it is a uh, so as it resembles little bit of the breast, it gave it gets it got its nomenclature. It is located behind the tympanic portion of the temporal bone. If you look into the shape of the mastoid in adults, it is a solid bulbous structure which is produced by by the expansion of the air cells as the child grows. So, if we look into this uh, picture, so let us refresh our anatomy first. This is the tympanic portion of the temporal bone. This is the mastoid portion. So, the solid bulbous structure is situated behind the tympanic portion, but they are not at similar level. Then this is the styloid process. This is the zygomatic process. This is the fossa for the condyle of the mandible. This is the squamous part of the temporal bone. So the mastoid ear cells are the pneumatized region of the temporal bone which are lined by mucosa and they are ventilated through the additus at antrum. Remember that at birth there is no actual process. This bulbous structure is seen in adults. At birth, it is flat. So, there is one foramen which arises from here that is, uh, which is located here that is the stylomastoid foramen from which the facial nerve arises. At birth, this mastoid process is flat and the stylomastoid foramen, it lies just behind this tympanic segment of the temporal bone. If you as, if, as we know that to this part of this mastoid, two muscles are attached. The first is the stenocleidomastoid and second is the posterior belly of digastric. So their role is as the child starts growing by first year of age, as the child starts uh, lifting his head and starts walking, what happens? The sternocleidomastoid and uh, this posterior belly of digastric, the keep a constant pull and the, because of the aeration, the air cells get pneumatized and it assumes its solid bulbous shape. In the mastoid air cells, the biggest air cell and the constant air cell is known as the mastoid antrum. This mastoid antrum is the largest air cell. It is, again, if we look into the histology, it is an air chamber which is lined by mucosa and which contains airs. So, there are bony partitions which contains air within it and they are lined by the mucosa. The nature of the mucosa which lies the mastoid air cell system is a single row of flattened squamous epithelium. Now, coming into the dimensions, from front to back, it measures 14 mm. Top to bottom, it measures around 9 mm and side to side, 7, 7 mm. So, this is a picture of the temporal bone. If we see that, this is the tympanic cavity. This opening which connects the tympanic cavity with the mastoid antrum is the additus at antrum. This is the mastoid air cell system. So, you can see here these mastoid air cells, they are not of similar size and shape. They are, there are multiple air cells of different sizes. The most constant air cell is known as mastoid antrum. This mastoid antrum, the interior wall is formed by actually a recess. It is not a, um, exactly a wall. It is an opening of the additus ad antrum which connects the epitympanum with the mastoid cavity. Posterior wall and the floor is formed by the this by the mastoid portion of the temporal bone. So, this is the mastoid portion of the temporal bone. It is forming the floor. It is forming the posterior wall. 
medially this is the medial portion it is formed by the petrous part of the temporal bone which is related to the posterior and the horizontal semicircular canal the roof which is known as the tegment entry this is the roof of the tegment entry which separates it from the temporal lobe the lateral part is formed by the squamous part of the temporal bone what is a mequinez triangle mequinez triangle is also known as the supramedial triangle it is actually a anatomical landmark to identify the mastoid antrum during the mastoid surgeries the mastoid antrum is located deep to this area around at a depth of 1.5 cm in adults but in case of children it is more superficial so this mequinez triangle it is a uh, arbitrary it is a triangle which is formed by three lines the if you look here superiorly it is formed by the supramedial crest or the temporal line so this is a picture of the temporal bone to refresh this is the tympanic part tympanic ring or the tympanic part of the temporal bone this is the mastoid process this is the zygoma this is the fossa for the condyles this is the supramedial crest so the first line of the mequinez triangle is formed by the supramedial crest second line is formed by the posterior superior bony external canal so if we see here this is the bony part of the external canal the second line runs through this and the third boundary is formed by the tangential line to the posterior metal wall so this is the third line so this triangular area is known as mequinez triangle it has a uh, cribriform appearance if you see here there are multiple dot 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 like uh, depressions so it is it looks like a sieve these depressions or cribriform appearance is formed due to multiple emissary vessels passing through the mastoid cortex so the clinical importance of mequinez triangle is that as i told you it is an important landmark to identify the mastoid antrum during mastoid surgeries first then second is the mastoid antrum it lies at a depth of 15 mm deep to the bone but it is more superficial in case of children because the pneumatization is not complete and it is more superficial during the clinical examination the mequinez triangle can be palpated by palpating the area called simba concha of the pinna what is pneumatization as from the name itself pneumatization of the mastoid and the temporal bone region it is defined as the process of air space formation within the temporal bone here there is a picture of two x rays from where you can make out the different type of mastoids so to just this is not an x ray class but just to refresh to read an x ray of the mastoids we need to look into certain things first is we have to see look for the condyle so as you can see here the solid smooth structure the shadow is formed by the condyle second we have to look for the external auditory canal so here is the external auditory canal this is the condyle in this x ray if we go here this is the condyle bulbous structure and this is the external auditory canal so as mastoid is situated behind the external auditory canal so this is the area of mastoid if we trace here this is the area of mastoid which is showing multiple bony partitions which is filled with air remember the air looks black in x ray so this is the multiple partitioned structure this is the mastoid area but if we look here this here we are not seeing any air cells rather it is all opacified and it is all whitish so this is a x ray of the pneumatized mastoid and this is a x ray of the sclerotic mastoid the pneumatization of the temporal bone it mainly arises from the squamous and the petrous part of the temporal bone out of all the pneumatization of the temporal bone 
Mastoid is the largest nematized area. The other nematized area are present around the labyrinth, that is the semicircular canal, sometimes around the petrous apex, bones of the zygoma, styloid, and occipital region. These are the collections of bony compartments, which is lined by mucosa and that opens into the middle ear's place by either editus, ad antrum, or by the other ear cell tracts. And moreover, the pneumatization is not similar in all the individuals. So there are certain factors which affects the pneumatization of the mastoid and the other regions of the temporal bone and which explains why the mastoid is not similar in all the individuals. So the factors which affects are the history of recurrent otitis media in infancy and early ch childhood, the factors which affect the middle ear ventilation like enlarged adenoids, uh, some eustachian tube dysfunction and lastly genetic. So, as we have uh, discussed, the pneumatize, as the pneumatization it, uh, process is going on, but all the mastoids are not similar. So, what are the different types of mastoids? There are three different types of mastoids. The first is the cellular mastoid, next is the diploid, and last is the acellular. So, there are certain differences. In the cellular mastoid, the majority of the air cells are large and they are numerous. Appearance is like honeycomb. We have seen in the x-ray in the previous slide. In the diploic uh, type of mastoids, the air cells, they are small in size and they are less numerous. Here what happens, the marrow which is present at birth in the bony compartments, it persists. It is not replaced by air. In the acellular or the sclerotic mastoid, the air cells and the marrow cell spaces are totally absent and they appear totally whitish in X-ray or CT scan. So, to give you the example of cellular mastoid, this is one CT scan of the uh, CT scan which is showing this mastoid air cell system. So, as we can see here, these are multiple bony partitions in the mastoid region which contains air. That is why it is looking black in color on both the sides. Its appearance, it resembles the honeycomb. This is the picture of the honeycomb. So, the cellular mastoid, it appears, it looks like a honeycombed appearance. To differentiate between the three types of mastoids, this figure is given. So, if you see here in the cellular mastoids, the the mastoid air cells, they are of different sizes and they are numerous in number. This is a cellular mastoid. The air cells are bigger in size and more in number in comparison to the diploic mastoid. In the diploic mastoid, the air cells are small in size and they are less in number. In the sclerotic or the acellular mastoid, the mastoid, there is no air cells, no marrow spaces and they are totally white or solid bone. So, what is the importance, clinical importance of pneumatization? The first importance is that poor pneumatization is associated with chronic ear disease which is a consequence of hyperventilation. So, chronic superative otitis media, uh, unsafe type is seen more in acellular or the sclerotic type of mastoid. The surgery of these poorly ma pneumatized mastoid may prevent certain complications like automastoiditis and cholestatoma formation and cholestatoma or eticoenteral type of CSOM is seen in poorly pneumatized mastoids. Moreover, the air cell tracts, they help the surgeon during surgery of the temporal region. So, what are the regions of pneumatization? So, mastoid as we have discussed, mastoid is the largest area of the pneumatization of the temporal bone. The other accessory areas are zygoma, the zygo zygoma, squamous, part occipital and styloid. So, let us see the different areas of pneumatization of the mastoid. The first 
the mastoid antrum is the largest air cell and around the mastoid antrum certain group of air cells are present these are known as the periantral cells so this is the area for the periantral cells so sigmoid sinus it lies here so this group of uh, air cells is known as the perisinus cells this is the facial nerve if you can see here it is running uh, it is running from the middle ear it is becoming vertical so the group of air cells in relation to the facial nerve they are known as perifacial cells the air cells present at the tip of the mastoid they are known as tip cells again they are divided into superficial and deep cells depending on the location of the attachment of uh, posterior belly of digastric then this is the area of the labyrinthine cells which can be perilabyrinthine supra supralabyrinthine and infralabyrinthine cells that means the cells lying in relation to the semicircular canal then medially lies here if we see the zygoma bone is there so this is the area for the zygomatic group of air cells medially lies the petrous bone so the group of air cells sometimes may be nematized in the petrous part the next part is the next is the squamous part squamous part it lies laterally stylite process sometimes can be pneumatized and sometimes the occipital region also in the previous slide we have seen the different areas of pneumatization but sometimes air cell tracts are also present so these air cell tracts of pneumatization they circumnavigate the labyrinth bones lining the middle and the posterior fossa sigmoid sinus carotid artery and facial nerve that means they do not traverse through these structures but rather they move around these structures so since these air cell tracts they uh, they run around these important structures so during the surgery of the temporal region in involving these structures these air cell tracts they help the surgeon to uh, to reach the disease area and to they help to avoid these important intracranial structures so what is the importance these air air cell tracts they provide pathway for the spread of ear disease that means from the middle ear diseases sometimes the disease may spread to the middle and the posterior cranial fossa sigmoid sinus carotid artery involves facial nerves so so the ear cell tracts they help in transmission of the disease Ra some and moreover they are also the pathway for the drainage of cerebrospinal cerebrospinal fluid to the ear or the nose in surgery or the trauma of the temporal region so the different air cell tracts are the posterior superior air tract that is the synodural tract posterior medial that is the retrofacial and the retrolabyrinthine subarcuate perilabyrinthine and peritubule so first let us look into the ct scan so this is the area of the mastoid this is the area of the sigmoid sinus so the posterior superior air cell tract will be running like this this is the area of the petrous bone if you see here this petrous bone is pneumatized so what is the importance of these air cell tracts obstruction of these air cell tracts by edema or any inflammation can lead to the formation of cholesterol granuloma if the petrous apex is pneumatized and if it gets infected from the uh, middle ear uh, middle ear cavity through this air cell tract what can happen inflammation of the petrous apex that is petrous epicytis if this petrous apex is inflamed sometimes it can lead to the presentation patient may present to you as gradinego syndrome that is uh, inflammation in the petrous apex which affects the cranial nerve fifth and sixth the presentation will be as diplopia retroorbital pain and otorrhea so till now we have seen the different types of pneumatization but what are the theories for the failure of pneumatization so these theories they explain 
why some mastoids are not cellular. So different theories were given at different times. So the four theories which is uh, which explains the failure of pneumatization are the theory. The first is given by Albrecht. Albrecht he believed that most of the damage done to the mesenchyme was due to the bleeding from the suffocation or the birth injury. According to the Whitmack, he believed that the deficient pneumatization it results from infantile otitis media which interfered with the normal resorption of diploid. As per Tumarkin, he believed that the frustration of pneumatization results from failure of aeration of the middle ear cleft due to blockage of the eustachian tube. It occurs in upper respiratory cataract. According to the Diamond and Dalbor, they contended that the dense bone is congenital and is a normal variant. With this, we come to the end of this video. Thank you.